Thank you. It's great to be here. And I've uh, got lots of time, and I'm going to, oh, uh, at the end, uh, have lots of time for questions because I think that uh, I'd like a dialogue more than just a monologue. So as, as, my, uh, as my bio says, I've been looking mostly at the pharmaceutical industry and the way that they market and sell not just drugs, but theories of disease. And that was really sort of the, the, the thrust behind writing Selling Sickness. Though I stumbled upon the idea of, I started looking what was coming upstream from the pharmaceutical industry, and I realized that medical screening was really a vast way to capture new people into becoming patients. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But before I get going, the most important thing you need to know when anybody's talking about the pharmaceutical industry is do they have a financial conflict of interest with the companies or the products of which they're speaking? And I can tell you that I have no financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I'm not supported by Le uh, Lilly or Pfizer or by any of the companies that make screening uh, tools or, or pharmaceuticals. Um, this is important because a lot of time the information that you get from people who are selling either theories of disease or theories around screening will have financial conflicts, and it's important to know what those are. Um, my work is funded by uh, the university, and uh, I do independent research, and I write books. Um, yeah. Um, so I've always been somewhat of a skeptic. I'd like to maintain. Uh, this is me at about three years old. Uh, my sister maintained that I was uh, the, the kid who would believe everything, but that's not true, and then I'm proving it with this uh, photograph. I was always a little skeptical of what people are telling me, and it has proven to be um, a good thing. Uh, as an adult, I can be quite skeptical. I did a, a version, by the way, a shorter version of this talk for TEDx uh, in Victoria about uh, five years ago. So I adapted my slides from that talk, but um, I'm gonna talk about basically how I got into studying s screening and the surprises I came, uh, I, I stumbled upon along the way. Um, one day I was reading my newspaper, and uh, this is the Victoria Times columnist, and this yellow flyer dropped out of the paper, and I, uh, and I thought it was just a, a piece of spam, and I was going to throw it in the recycling. But I, um, I'm going to zip ahead here. It looked like this. It said, a body scan can save your life. And I thought, wow, I want my life to be saved. How can that work? This was a company, a private company in Port Angeles, Washington. Now, Victoria is right on the, uh, the southern tip of Vancouver Island. And when you look across the Straits of Juan de Fuca, you see Port Angeles. It's a little town in Washington State, beautiful little town. And there was a company that was setting up this mobile screening uh, um, facility that was luring Canadians to come down and get a full body scan. And they were using an ultrasound there. Full body scans can use a number of different screening tools, including um, uh, fairly heavy duty CT scanners that can scan the entire body. When I saw this, it kind of blew my mind away because I thought, is there actually any evidence that you can save somebody's life by giving them a full body scan? And I said, I have to look into this more closely. And so what I ended up doing is uh, myself, I, went, I took it to some of my colleagues at the university and said, we've got to study this stuff. They are marketing full body screening to Canadians, and I know Americans were exposed to this as well, that um, was promising to save people's lives. But could they actually save lives? And I, I went back and I found a document from the World Health Organization, and this was from uh, 1968. There it is there. And it, it basically listed, what does a good screening test look like? I thought, okay, this is great. At least somebody 50 years ago was going to examine what are the, 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 the prime constituents of a good screening test. You know, the condition should be important. It should be a problem that you can have a treatment for. There should be facilities to diagnose, and treatment should be available. Uh, there should be a latent stage of disease, which is to say medical screening is not medical diagnosis. Medical screening is taking perfectly healthy people and saying to them, you may have a disease, you may have something lurking in your body, which could go on to hurt you. 
And what we can do with our screening technique, with a, either as a, a scan or other forms of screening, we can determine that there's something that's going to go on to hurt you, and we can stop it in its tracks. That's the theory behind screening. But these conditions set out by the World Health Organization now 50 years ago listed all these criteria for which a good screening test should conform to. And I will tell you right now, after studying this and writing a book about medical screening, I don't think any medical screening test can conform to what a good screening test looks like. Um, what screening is all mostly about is finding pre-disease. And I have to say that pre-disease is, is not wholly but largely a construction of the pharmaceutical industry where looking for diseases before they go on to hurt you is a huge vast number of people because all of us are pre-diseased. We're all pre-dead as well. <laughs> and, and if you can find pre-disease in people, then you can treat them. And that's a much larger market for your products if you can get pre-diseased people. Um, whether you're pre-hypertensive, pre-diabetic, pre-hypercholesterolemic. Uh, so these are before they go on to hurt you. And I talk about this in the book, but what I'm going to focus on mostly here is the things that I found around cancer screening. Because that's probably the area in which there is the best evidence. Cancer screening has actually been well studied. And it's been well studied for more than 25 years. And the two forms of cancer um, screening that I think is probably got the best evidence is around mammography. So I know some of you came here to expect the mammography. Don't worry, we'll get to it. Uh, and the other form for men is, is, is prostate cancer screening. So. This is a machine that, uh, that, that might be used for a full body scan. And they used to sell these in the US. I don't think this happens anymore, where they would say, come in, we can do a full body scan. It's going to be $1,000. And we can detect anomalies in your body that, we can go that, that, uh, that will be signs of pre-disease. And we can do something about that to save your life. So I said, OK, well, has this ever been studied? And I f that's what I, uh, a full body CT scan uh, looks like. Now, um, CT scanners, how much radiation do you think they deliver compared to, say, a, ch a chest x-ray? It's a very controversial question because it depends on who you ask. But it's somewhere between three to 500 times the amount of radiation in a CT uh, full body scan than you would get from a, just a normal x-ray. Huge amounts of radiation. And, but what they can do with this is that they can find anomalies within your body. So, the test does work to the extent that they can find things that are unusual, but the question is, what do we do with that? Um, so we studied this. So we looked at, we looked at how, um, and this was a report that I wrote a few years ago, and that was a precursor to my book. What is it in a scan? And so the first question you have to ask is, how well has it been studied, and are the claims that they're making about this body scan can save your life, is there any evidence behind them? I found one very good study, and it was done in San Diego uh, by a woman named um, uh, Dr. Furtado. She took 1,192 healthy volunteers and gave them a full body scan. Okay? That was almost, you know, almost 1,200 people got a full body scan. What percentage of those people do you think they found an anomaly in? Would it be 5%? 10%? It was 86%. So 86% of the people, these healthy people, no symptoms. These are healthy individuals, no symptoms. 86% um, of them have an anomaly. In fact, the average number of anomalies inside a person is somewhere between two and a half. So when you think that you're pers perfectly healthy, if I took everyone in this room and gave you a full body scan, we would on average find two to three things that are unusual and may require further investigation in you. It's not that you're going to sick, be sick and die from it. You might, but it's quite unlikely. You know, uh, you might have a bit of scar tissue in your lung that you had developed from when you got bronchitis as a kid, and that'll show up on a, on a CT scan. You might have a, a, a calcification in your breast that is never going to go on to hurt you, but that may show up as a, uh, on your scan. So they're very good at finding unusual things within the body. The question is, what do they do when they find them? Now, um, mammography has always 
been promoted, when I say always, it's been promoted for more than 30 years as something that smart women would do, right? This is an advertisement which even today shocks me when I read This is from uh, um, Mother Jones magazine in uh, 1992. And this ad says, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need more than your breasts examined. The implication being here is that you're taking chances with your health if you, if you don't go out and get an annual mammogram. Now, uh, and of course it says a mammogram is a safe, low-dose x-ray that can detect breast cancer before there's a lump. If you're a woman over 35, be sure to schedule a mammogram. 35. I can tell you in the last, well, almost 30 years, that number has changed. They don't tell 35-year-old women to get mammograms anymore. They don't tell 40-year-old women to get mammograms. In fact, the recommendations by probably the best experts on uh, breast cancer screening would be the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which goes by the initials USPSTF, uh, experts who have no financial ties to the screening industry, who assess the research of mammography, and they say that Yes, um, mammography should be offered for women over 50 periodically. Maybe that might be two to three years. So you might say, how has the world changed in these last 30 years where they used to be recommending mammography, annual breast cancer screening for women, 35 and over, and now they're saying women over 50 should do it occasionally. How come that has changed? And I'll tell you, there's two things why it's changed. The first reason is better research. We've now got 30 years, at least, of, 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 of research on the effects of mammography. And the effects meaning how many lives have been saved and how much um, uh, consequent medical uh, adventures that has caused. So the first reason is there's better evidence. The second reason is that there's this thing called overdiagnosis. And if you're going to be here on Saturday, that's going to be the subject of my, of my other talk, is overdiagnosis. Um, so and I'll explain to you, I'll show you graphically what overdiagnosis looks like. But first, let me ask you a question. How many women, so they say mammography will save a life. How many women do you have to screen every year for 10 years to save one life? So is it 50? Is it 100? Is it 300? Is it 1,000? It's a, it's a very large number. I think most women, when they're told that uh, you need to have a mammogram because it will save your life, might think that, you know, if there's a 1 in 100 or a 1 in 50 chance that this is going to save my life, that might be worth doing. It's an it's a individual choice, though. Well, I can tell you that a lot of people, and when they've studied this, they might say um, 1 in 80. You know, if you, if, if you screen 80 women every year for 10 years, uh, you'd save one life. That might be, is that a decent yield? Well, it's up to you. Um, but I can tell you it's a lot more than that. In fact, when they've studied more than 25 years worth of mammography screening, and this was uh, done by uh, members of the Cochrane Collaboration and others, looking at the, the, the quality of the studies between cohorts of women who have been screened and, and women who haven't been screened. And they follow them for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and look at what are the rates of breast cancer, death, and so on. We, it's not one in 80 you have to screen to prevent one death. You have to screen 2,100 women every year for 10 years to prevent one death from breast cancer. Okay? But along the way, you might say, well, that's, that's a pretty low yield. Well, it is what it is. That's what the, that's what the best scientific evidence says. One in 2,100 women screened every year for 10 years. So you might say, well, what happens when you screen all these women? Well, as I've indicated with the, uh, with the um, full body scan, you're going to find all kinds of stuff. And in fact, of those 2,100 women, how many women would have, uh, would they find something unusual? Those would be what we'd call false positives. About 690. So almost a third of the women who have undergone this screening for 10 years will have, they will discover some form of false positive. A false positive is something where it, sh it will show up on the x-ray, it will be something unusual, and it will require further investigation. And that further investigation typically will be uh, a biopsy, 
uh, possibly beginning the cascade of other medical treatments. And the biopsy may lead to uh, surgery, uh, chemotherapy, um, and uh, a fair bit of anxiety on the women who have been told that they have breast cancer, but it will never go on to hurt them. When I say it will never go on to hurt them, of these 2,100 women, you've saved one life, and you've caused 609 to experience false positive anxiety. See, this is one thing that is never measured in the calculus of medical screening, is how much psychological anxiety and worry and harm are you causing to, to people when you tell them you're going to save their lives, you give them a screening test that promises to save their life, you find something unusual that will never go on to hurt them, and then you lead them into a huge amount of medical activity. As you can imagine, the breast screening industry is huge. Um, we've got, uh, I think it's the same in the US as it is in Canada, what we, we have what's called Pinktober. So October is colonized by the, by the breast cancer charities who raise money to, to raise awareness. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with raising awareness about breast cancer, but one of the main messages behind the, the um, you know, uh, the, the, the pink uh, um, activities is, uh, is get your mammogram. Um, and get it every year. So um, men also experience uh, um, some level of invasive screening as well. And uh, prostate cancer, so if, if October is Pinktober, November is, uh, is what we call Movember, okay? Movember is where men are encouraged to uh, grow mustaches and raise awareness for prostate cancer, right? Prostate cancer kills about 3% of men. So if you live uh, long enough, um, and this, is, this has been confirmed, it's very interesting. Um, prostate cancer is one of those things that most men will die with, but not of, right? And they know this because they've done um, a huge number of, of um, autopsy studies. So they'll take men in their, you know, whatever age they are, who die of a different cause, maybe in a car accident or an industrial accident. And they'll do an autopsy and they'll find, oh, this man had prostate cancer. And they'll find that, you know, that risk of de uh, detecting unusual cells in your prostate goes up as you, as you age. So I'm 53 years old. There's a good chance. I probably have a 50% chance of having some unusual prostate cancer cells if they were to do a prostate uh, PSA test. Now, the PSA test is a lot less invasive than mammography in the sense of you, um, it's just a simple blood test. They can measure the level of an antigen in your blood and determine that you have some level of prostate cancer. And of course that leads to biopsies. It often leads to surgery, uh, drugs, and as you can imagine, a whole cascade of medical interventions that, that follow, uh, including a lot of overdiagnosis. So the question is, how many men do you have to give a PSA test to save one life? Because we were told in Movember, go out, encourage your loved ones, do it for your loved ones, get your PSA test. Well, the, the yield is not that great. So for the PSA test, you have to screen 1,400 men to save one life from prostate cancer. Okay? See? Is that good or that bad? It, uh, it is what it is. But along the way, you end up treating a lot of men. And in fact, um, about 48 of those uh, 1,400 men will get treated. And the treatment, um, as one uh, person described to me, the thing is about prostate cancer treatment is that it won't, make, it won't make your life longer. It will just make your life feel longer. Which is to say a lot of uh, prostate cancer treatment involves men becoming impotent or um, incontinent. And, uh, and the future is often in diapers for men who have been treated for prostate cancer. So um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna read just a little bit from, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit from here because I say it much more eloquently in my, in my book than I do. Um, let me just, why is it doing that? So, um, Maybe you can fix that. Um, have you heard of Zero? So Z Zero is a is a prostate awareness program uh, uh, organization. So Zero um, 
collects an enormous amount of corporate money every year, and their goal is quite simple. Their goal is to end prostate cancer, okay? So I say the zero folks have, and the zerocancer.org is their, is their um, uh, website. The zero folks have set themselves an incredibly lofty goal. Quote, we're committed to creating Generation Zero, the first generation of men free from prostate cancer, their website proclaims. One of the key messages, get a PSA test. The Zero likes to, and Zero likes to make it easy for men to get that test. One of their campaign arms asks, can't get where you need to go for a PSA test? Then join Zero's Drive Against Prostate Cancer. According to its site, more than 110,000 men have been tested for free on board the Drive Against Prostate Cancer mobile medical program since 2002. From tracking high PSA results and then alerting those men to see their doctor, the drive has saved as many as 12,000 lives, they claim. So a lot of male-dominated disease groups, um, and the leadership of Zero knows that, certainly in Canada, are interested in professional sports. And in the Canadian situation, it's hockey. So the Zero website makes this rather bizarre claim that the Zero is the, quote, official prostate cancer charity of the National Hockey League. I think, wow. The National Hockey League has, it, oh, has its own <laughs> prostate cancer charity. So um, Zero has a serious political side to its activities. <coughs> Just as the US PSTF a few years ago was updating its recommendations on PSA testing, they were telling men, this is probably not a necessary test, don't do it. Zero jumped into action It began lobbying the US Congress to make sure that no one was going to take away men's God-given right to wear diapers. Diapers, yes. So in part of its press release announcing the Zero works with Congress to protect early detection, the organizer said it was mounting an aggressive campaign on Capitol Hill to combat the task force infringement on the doctor-patient relationship. One of the corporate partners, and there were many corporate partners, largely most of them were pharmaceutical companies, but also uh, um, other forms of um, uh, uh, sort of healthcare, robotic surgery, and so on. One of their corporate partners is in this effort is Depends, a brand of adult diapers. The makers, sorry, the, 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 the irony of this just blew me away. The makers of Depends are also unafraid of jumping into the ring to participate in what seems to be fear-mongering around prostate cancer. Depends says every three minutes a man in this country finds out he has prostate cancer. The good news is that early detection, a result of screening, comes with almost 100% survival rate. The good news is that uh, without screening, there's almost 100% survival rate. So Depends website reminds us that uh, they've teamed up with Zero and their project to end prostate cancer and they want to get the help, get the, get the word out. Now, there's a guy that I interviewed for this book and he wrote what I think to be, he had the best title for any healthcare book that I've ever read. It was the, 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 the guy I interviewed was, uh, was a urologist, uh, Dr. Mark Schultz, and he's from Marina Del Rey in California. And he wrote a book called The Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers. I'm not making that up. It's a, it's a fascinating read. And what motivated to write him to write that book was that he was, quote, absolutely aboard the rolling disaster that no one seemed to want to do anything about. He says that most cancer treatment in the U.S. is managed by oncologists who's, who are specialists in cancer. But prostate cancer treatment is managed by urologists who are surgeons, right? As I say to my kids, don't ask a barber if you need a haircut. Don't ask a urologist. Anyway, so in Dr. Schultz's estimation, and I love this quote, he says, the PSA is like bait to put out, put, to put out, sorry, PSA is like bait to put out for animals to suck them into the gravitational pull of the surgeons who immediately cut out your prostate. Those are harsh words, but he has the data to back them up. He says, even though the last five years they realized you can safely watch men, newly diagnosed men, you can safely watch them called Watchful Waiting. He says, the use of surgery has doubled. Wow, doubled. And I said, what's that about? His rapid fire explanation comes in two words, robotic surgery. High tech companies are brought in to do the surgery. So, you know, and Dr. Schultz is somewhat dismissive. He's because it's, it's just another type of surgery. The robotic part is a bit of a misnomer. They have a human that is steering the thing. It's better to be, is it better to be operated on, a, on by a robot than a human? Not really. When they've studied this, the rates of incontinence and impotence are similar 
to conventional sur surgery. And there's no long-term evidence of the effectiveness of robotic surgery. So he does have a point about, uh, about you know, invasion of the prostate snatchers indeed. Um, so <clears throat> I always wonder what people are told when they're offered medical screening other than this will save your life, this will be good for you, do this for the ones you love. Um, and I think that, that most people don't understand that any intervention, like a screening in intervention, I'm, again, I'm talking about healthy people. If you're a man who has symptoms, then you should go to your doctor and you may end up uh, getting a PSA test. If you have symptoms, that's a different story. That's a diagnostic procedure. The same with if you're a woman and you feel something unusual, in your breast, a lump or something, you should get that checked out. I'm talking about perfectly healthy people that have no symptoms, who are told to take a test because it will save their lives. And in this case, with um, uh, prostate cancer biopsies, for example, the, the rates of serious infection that happen probably not known by most men who undergo it. This guy down here, whose name is Robert Nam, did a study in Ontario, in, uh, published in JAMA in 2000, and he said that, uh, that about 3% of the men who get prostate biopsies go on to develop sepsis so serious they have to be hospitalized, and some of those men will die. And the treatment, as I've said before, it's going to mean many men will be left impotent or incontinent. 60% uh, of the men treated for prostate cancer were left impotent. 18 months after the surgery, 8% had urinary incontinence. So th the, 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 the eagerness to sell PSA screening has created a huge pool of overdiagnosis. And in fact, this guy here, uh, this is Gilbert, Dr. Gilbert Rutz, he wrote the foreword to my book, thankfully. He, he was quite an inspiration. His own book was called Overdiagnose, Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health. And I can tell you, he hit it bang on. He said to me that prostate cancer, um, or PSA testing, is the poster child for overdiagnosis. And he backed this up by saying, there are more than two million American men that have been treated unnecessarily for prostate cancer. Hmm. Okay. So again, that, that was the, uh, the article in, um, um, publishing the US PSTF's findings that there's little evidence to support advising PSA screening in men. So the good thing is that in the US and in Canada, you've got an independent government-funded organization that looks at the science around screening. And in this case, I don't agree with everything that the US PSTF says, but certainly on this one, they've looked at the studies and they have basically given it the thumbs down and the reason because of the overdiagnosis, the fact that the, the yield is very low and you inflict a huge amount, uh, you inflict a huge amount of suffering on the men who undergo that, that kind of treatment. So let me give you seven thoughts on screening. And uh, by the way, when I, w when I uh, wrote the book, I didn't just look at cancer screening. I looked at things like depression screening, uh, screening for Alzheimer's disease, screening for uh, low T. Have you heard of this before? So low T is low testosterone, and there is a, what they call a self-screening test. I have a chapter about this in, in my book as well, where you can go online and you can answer these 10 questions, and it's basically questions about, and it's directed towards men who are 45 and older, because as you get older and you're male, your testosterone level drops. It drops about 1% a year. So you have less stamina and less energy, than you used to. And these questions will be something like, do you often feel like you don't have as much stamina as you used to, or you can't play sports as well as you used to, or maybe you're just not as interested in sex as you used to be? And you look at this list as a 50-year-old guy, you go, yep, yep, yep. And guess what? If you answered you know, three yeses in this 10-point questionnaire, then you should go and check your doctor, because you might have low testosterone. And low testosterone, I can tell you, when they tell you to go see your doctor, it's because the pharmaceutical industry has already been to see your doctor, and they've instructed your doctor that when, you met, when your male patients come in complaining about their lack of stamina or the fact that they're really not that interested in sex anymore or they can't play sports as well as they used to, then they deserve to be offered uh, hormone, well, it's a type of hormone replacement. There's andropause uh, therapy. There, uh, this is testosterone. And this is a drug that, uh, when I looked at this, I was, I was kind of shocked because a lot of drugs when you take, they only affect you, right? 
But testosterone comes in a cream, and you spread it on your chest, right, and your arms, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's transformed, it goes into your skin. And that's how, it, that's how it's released into the body. The warnings, and I'm talking about US FDA warnings on testosterone replacement therapy, is basically don't play with your children and, 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 and don't hug your partner. Your, your, if you have a female partner, you shouldn't give them a hug if you've got this on your chest because you can cause androgenization. In fact, when th they have found that children who have been exposed to testosterone in the cream uh, develop um, uh, sexually much earlier. So, they're, they're, and this is a, this is not Alan Castles making this up. This is the U.S. FDA telling you be very careful with this drug. Anyways, so um, w main thoughts on screen, and I have maybe seven of them. So, overdiagnosis is a problem that I've identified, and it happens everywhere. You can be overdiagnosed for having low testosterone. You can be overdiagnosed for having depression when you don't, or signs of uh, hypertension or high cholesterol. Um, and this, this, this problem of overdiagnosis is becoming increasingly recognized by people who study the science behind screening. They're saying, we are causing a huge amount of overdiagnosis in people, and we should stop doing it. Um, and the economics. So, so th th this quote from Gary Schweitzer, who's a colleague of mine, and he has a, a, a website, by the way, called healthnewsreview.org. And uh, I, w I would say that, and uh, this is my bias here, I, have, I, have, um, I w um, do reviews for these guys. I've written blogs for them before. They analyze how the media treats um, uh, medical and healthcare topics. And he said that screening outside the boundaries evi of evidence could bankrupt the nation in a heartbeat. And that is so true, is that so much of the screening that gets promoted to people on the promises that it's going to save their lives, sometimes that screening is paid for by insurers, that affects uh, your premiums and your, and your, your health insurance costs. And, um, and if we were to allow any screening test that anyone wanted to launch onto the market, we would be bankrupt in a moment. Um, pseudo disease. So, so one of the, the one of the axioms that's used to sell screening and uh, frankly to sell a lot of healthcare is better safe than sorry. You know, wouldn't you rather be safe and 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 have a screening test or be sorry when it becomes too late? Well, so th the problem is is that um, the tests, the medications, the procedures, even the surgical procedures, they all have inherent risks, right? I, I said in my book, instead of saying better safe than sorry, I think the more appropriate axiom is look before you leap. Educate yourself about, about screening before you go into it. Part of the reason why I wrote the book and why I think that people need to go into screening with their eyes wide open. Um, sometimes, um, very interesting and unusual research uh, jumps out at me. and and. This was related to the natural history of breast cancer. So the question is, if you find breast cancer, signs of breast cancer in women, does that mean that they're automatically going to go on, develop breast cancer, and it will spread to the rest of their body, and they will die? No. That does happen. I, granted, breast cancer is still a major, uh, a major form of, of, of cancer death in women, though some cancers, believe it or not, disappear. When I say they disappear, it's not the cancer that's disappearing, it's the sign that disappears. And um, th this, uh, when the Norwegians studied this, basically spontaneous regression. They found, and they tracked women over several years, and they found that women in whom they found some anomaly, they did nothing. And they followed those women, and they found that when they tested them several years later, two or three years later, they found that they, the, the cancer had spontaneously re regressed. So, I want to I quote this guy. Mammography screen detects a lot of subclinical cancers that will never become clinical, which means it will never go on to hurt you. But the problem is, can you find something and do nothing about it? Really? I mean, in, in, in PSA uh, screening, a lot of men will be told, well, um, we found an uh, unusually high level of uh, your PSA. We've done a biopsy. There's evidence of prostate cancer. Now what do you want to do? And the guy will say, well, get it out. 
But of course, he's, he's, he's believing that the, that cancer will go on to kill him. He's not told that, you know, most men in your situation, if they leave it uh, well enough alone, they're going to die of something when they're in their old age. That cancer will not go on. Now, of course, there's this thing called wa watchful waiting. The question is, a lot of people, when they find something unusual, they can't do nothing. You can't unknow it, and that's the problem. If I tell you, if I give your child a test and it comes back saying that your child has attention deficit disorder, that diagnosis is gonna ride that kid for the rest of his life. So when you're doing this test, and the tests are, have faults with them, when you're doing these tests, you have to be very careful of the downstream consequences because if you impose a diagnosis on someone that isn't true or st sticks them in a box, you are giving them a burden that they probably don't deserve. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm really opposed to any form of mental health screening is that, again, mental health screening, we'll say depression screening. Um, you may be surprised to know that one of the major screening tools for depression is this PH9, I can't remember what it's called. It's, a, it's the major test that they determine whether the, the person might be diagnosed with depression and it's copyright by Pfizer. Pfizer is a major pharmaceutical company, if you don't know. And I say, how could that be? How could we allow a major pharmaceutical company to develop the, the, one of the essential screening tools for depression? Well, Pfizer makes Zoloft. Zoloft is a big uh, antidepressant. So if you can develop a screening tool that's wide enough to capture more and more people, you're gonna have more patients, you're gonna have more customers. Uh, I'm not making it up that the pharmaceutical industry is involved in, in, in uh, many types of development of screening tools. So we're also easily f fooled, okay? There's lots of hope, there's lots of hype around screening. Um, so this, this survey by Gregenzer and Gray, um, very fascinating. So they surveyed 10,000 Europeans and they found that almost 90% of men, they overestimate the benefits of PSA testing. And you know, over 90% of women also over, over overestimate the benefits. So when you ask them, well, how much do you think it will help? They sometimes estimate the benefits to be 10 times and sometimes 100 times more than it actually is. So this is a really important point whenever you're faced with a screening test is to know how much benefit am I likely to achieve from this test? Uh, because getting the actual numbers is really important. And uh, um, I, I, I go into this in a fair bit of detail, but um, so the other, the other question is informed consent. And this is something that um, fascinates me is sometimes you can be given a screening test and not even know it. And I say, well, how, how, how does that happen? Well, just imagine you've got a 50 year old guy, he goes in for his annual physical. Doctor says, I'm gonna send you for some blood work. Take some blood. He goes to the lab and, ch and, and there's a sheet there that tells him which test to do on the blood. You know, we'll check for his hemoglobin A1C, his cholesterol, check, 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 PSA, check, so on. They're just taking blood and they're running it through machines to see what. So then two weeks later, the guy gets a call from the doctor and says, I want you to come in, there's a concerning uh, result from your, from your test. And the doctor says, he said, Sam, well, just, just hold on to yourself. This is probably not a problem, but you, you probably have prostate cancer. And the guy goes, what, what do you mean? Like, how did you, how did you test me for prostate cancer? Oh, remember that blood test I sent you for two weeks ago? Yeah, I checked the box where you, so, so suddenly the person's life is completely changed from the doctor ticking the box to get a PSA test. The, the, the question of informed consent, I think, is, is very important and really underestimated in the medical world. A lot of people say, well, we'll do whatever you say, doctor, you know best. You know, and sometimes, and sometimes that's right, sometimes that's dead wrong, especially when you're being offered a screening test that could radically alter your life and you weren't even told in advance that you're getting the screening test. Wow. Now, if you are told that you're getting a screening test, a woman uh, getting a mammogram, you know, you can't spring that on her. It, it, it takes planning and it takes some, some level of, uh, of, of activity. But, you know, um, what is a woman told beforehand before she gets her mammography? Is she told that there's a fairly high rate of overdiagnosis? That if they find something, 
there's a more than 80% chance it's going to be an anomaly that will never go on to hurt her? Um, is she given the straight goods? And, and frankly, since mammography has been so much studied and so much in the news, there are some very good uh, patient-oriented information that explains mammography and the benefits and the risks to consumers. But you know what? When I've read the stuff that's available, say, through the American Cancer Society, that stuff is not informative at all. You don't get any sense of whether there's a level of benefit or risk to it. It's completely uninformative. Um, so screening involves harm, and it also involves risks, and it also involves cost. Um, so the other thing, too, is that it's very, very hard to unadopt screening. Once you've started a screening program, whether it's um, uh, for uh, prostate cancer screening, uh, lung cancer screening, colon cancer screening, once you have those programs in place and you have physicians who are telling their patients, you have to get a colonoscopy or you have to have a fecal occult blood test, once they start doing that and, they, uh, and research emerges over time, that, you know what, we're causing a level of overdiagnosis, we're harming people by the test. You try to bring that back, you try to wind that back, and it's very hard to unadopt a screening test. Why? Well, some people think, well, we just need a newer test, we just need a better test. And that, that might be true, and I think there are newer and probably better ways to, to test for, for, um, for breast cancer anyways. Um, but once you have the screening test, try, try to unadopt it is, is, is really difficult. Um, so I say you can't forget the role of big pharma in screening for new customers. Um, now, you say, well, how involved can pharma really be in the screening world? And I can tell you there is good evidence that they've not only uh, been involved in, in affecting screening for, um, for depression, for bipolar disorder, for uh, attention deficit disorder, for low testosterone. And here's one little bit of evidence. So this is uh, just a, an a, a, a ad from a newspaper where um, the, uh, the representative from Eli Lilly is giving a check for $500,000 to screening for mental health in support of the organization's annual National Depression Screening Day. Wow. You know, th th this is to me, in a picture, a symbol of what is wrong, is that when you allow the pharmaceutical industry to help define what is illness, then you are giving them the power to sell more and more drugs to healthy people. Okay, so I think it's worth examining our beliefs around medical screening, you know? Because we all have very, very, very strong beliefs and I have had debates with people who have been through mammography testing, who have had the experience of a false positive, have gone on and had um, uh, surgery, and then come back, and they are the most powerful vocal um, promoters of breast cancer screening because they say, it saved my life. Even though the likelihood that it saved your life is very small, people will believe that the PSS, PSA test saved their lives the mammography screen saved their life. Oh, if we didn't take our kid for this screen for attention deficit disorder, um, that saved his life, okay? We always believe that if you find something early, it, it's always better. But we do have lots of proof that sometimes it's worse, and much worse, and life-changing. So screening programs are often, you know, put out there in the public on the basis of this belief and not evidence. And you know, when I, when I was asked, I saw, when this book came out and I was asked, uh, I did a couple interviews with uh, various um, journals and it was reviewed in a couple of newspapers. And one of the journalists asked me, so of all the screening tests, which one would you do? It was a good question. Which one would I do? And I had to think very deeply and I said, I think when the evidence looks a little bit better around colon cancer screening, I would consider that one. I think the jury is still out, and of course anybody watching this is going to uh, tell me that their lives have been saved from colon cancer screening because they went in um, and examined the inside of their intestines with a little scope and they found polyps and they removed them and removing those polyps saved their lives. 
That's a very strong belief. And that's part of the appeal of colonoscopies is that they can go in with a little camera and snake their way up through your intestines and look at, your, uh, look at the quality of your, of your, um, of your colon. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we still don't know whether removing those polyps is actually going to prevent you from developing prostate er, uh, colon cancer in the future. We think, we think it will. And that's why I say the evidence is still. But the, the industry that has built up around colon cancer screening is massive. The money involved is mind-boggling. The, 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 the need, therefore, to get people to fear death by colon cancer and to go in and do something preventative, like get a colonoscopy, which could cost several thousand dollars and, and use up a, a lot of time of a radiologist to interpret findings and so on, that they can go in and it's kind of like they go on this little space mission and they, and they take out the bad guys. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very good. It, it fits with the American myth of going out into the wilderness and doing something really well that's going to save uh, humanity. Um, so we have a much more exaggerated belief in almost any kind of screening. Uh, uh, lately, I've seen that um, there has been some recommendations around lung cancer screening. You say, well, wow, that, that seems like a good thing because lung cancer actually is a fairly major cause of, of death. I mean, it is the, I think it's probably the leading cause of cancer death in the U.S., mostly tied to smoking and environmental exposure. So you can be exposed to, to asbestos, for example, and develop lung cancer. Um, actually, my, my, my uncle died two weeks ago from lung cancer, never smoked in his life. He, had, he was uh, an industrial electrician, worked around big plants where they had lots of, a lots of asbestos and developed the, uh, the, the, uh, the cancer from that. Um, lung cancer screening uses CT scans. Some, they used to use x-rays, but they, more and more they're using CT scans. And they can find all kinds of things in lungs. And when they study lung cancer screening, they have to enroll an awful lot of people. Why is that? is because the yield is so low. In fact, the big major uh, lung cancer screening trial that was done here in the US, thank you, thank you US government for paying for that, it took about three or four years. They enrolled 53,000 people. And these weren't regular people. These were people were, were, which had a 30-pack year history of smoking. And what's that? Well, you smoke a pack a day for 30 years. Those are the patients that are in, in the trial. Okay, those patients have sort of exposed themselves to a lot of harmful uh, smoke over the years. How many of those were saved by having lung cancer screening? I can tell you it was so shockingly small, I, I, I almost didn't believe the findings. It was, you know, in the, with the mammography, you have to screen 2,000 women for 10 years to prevent one death. With lung cancer screening, to prevent one death of lung cancer screening, you have to screen thousands of people. And thousands and thousands, and, and, and not just regular people. We're talking heavy smokers. I mean, these are people that are high risk. But what happens is that the screening test is promoted for high risk people. Other people might say, well, maybe I would benefit from that too. Let's see. I grew up in a household where my mom and dad smoked. I was exposed to secondhand smoke. Maybe I have a high risk of lung cancer. Maybe I should get the lung cancer screen. Okay. I mean, that, that's, that's the kind of logic that we go through. Uh, again, very, yo very low yield, um, and a lot, of can a lot of these CT scans will actually increase your risk of subsequent risk of cancer. There was, a, there was an inter interesting study a few years ago that was reported in the New York Times, and they estimated that about 2 to 3% of new cancers in the U.S. are caused by excessive use of CT screening. So... So by an excessive use, that would be screening people for things for which they... I mean, if you're very sick and a CT scan is going to help diagnose you and treat you, there is no problem with that. But if you're taking your otherwise healthy people and exposing them to uh, the risk of, of the radiation of a CT scan, that's a completely different category. So the last thing, people believe that they're getting balanced information. And, and th this is part of the problem. This is part of the reason why I wrote this book is because there's many, many examples where 
people are getting very biased information. They're getting information, like my first slide, from, from companies that are promoting certain uh, products for certain diseases and, uh, and, and certain uh, types of, um, of screening. So where to go for good information? I think in the last five years, ever since my book was published, I'm just kidding, the, that there has been a, a sort of explosion of, of, of better quality uh, information around screening. Um, Peter Gotche, who's, uh, who's one of the co-founders of the Cochrane Collaboration right there in the mi middle, um, he wrote a book called Mammography Screening, Truth, Lies, and Controversy. And I can tell you, um, this guy is a ferocious advocate for evidence and he is so anti-mammography screening, he makes me look like you know, a, a tame little rabbit. Um, th and there's the book I mentioned, The Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers. No more unnecessary biopsies, radical treatment, or loss of sexual potency. Um, and the US Preventive Service Task Force, you know, what's interesting, I noticed this mostly by reading American media and looking at how government bodies are, are discredited in the media. So you'll get these cancer uh, charities, for example, who are out lobbying Congress, out you know, advertising and promoting their, their form of screening test, when the independent experts who are paid for by the government are saying, you shouldn't do it. You should back off from doing it. And there's always this, oh, you're saying that because you're just a government-funded stooges. Well, you know, I think I would rather trust the government-funded stooge than the, than the cancer charity that is making millions of dollars um, promoting uh, a vision of screening that is mostly unhelpful for people. So um, my last little bit of advice is that you have to be careful of reading health books because you could die of a misprint. So I'm, I'm really ready to open this up to questions and uh, I would invite any, any, and remind me to repeat the question so that the, the, um, so that the people online can, can hear it. Yes. So thermography, is that what you said? Yeah. So my, what is my opinion on thermography as a screening tool? Um, I, I would say the jury is out. I, I'm, I'm not really up on the research, but I would say that thermography, like a lot of new screening programs, is promoted as safer uh, and hence more effective. I don't know if that's true. And I know, because even when I was writing this book, my sister called me and said, what do you think of thermography? And I was forced to actually look at the evidence then. This was you know, maybe five years ago. And I, 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 I couldn't see that there was any major advantage or disadvantage to it. So I really can't give an, a, a, a strong opinion either way. Yes? Um, back to the PSA test, I'm asking if you're familiar with Dr. Richard Ablin and his book, The Great Prostate Hoax. <laughs> and for the audience, Dr. Richard Ablin is the gentleman who discovered PSA, yeah. and he says, PSA is not and was never intended to be a cancer marker. A man's PSA level goes up and down throughout the day, depending on his activities. He will say, if you have done a jostling activity, your PSA is going to go up. If you rode a bike, if you yeah. had sex, if you jumped on yeah. a trampoline. So yeah. it was never a, P a cancer marker. Men are getting screened you know, by the hundreds of thousands yeah. and being told they have cancer when it's not even a cancer uh, marker. Yeah, Please absolutely. Comment. Yeah, so, so yes, he, he did say that, and, and, and he did... He looked at the use of PSA tests in the wider community with horror, as if someone inventing a nuclear bomb would look at the world at, with horror as well, that this technology that, that they thought was going to be used for one thing gets used for something completely different. And yeah, it's, um, when, the, when the inventor of the test himself comes out and says, stop doing this, you've got to pay attention to that, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. Yes? My husband just went through all of this, and he, his <laughs> PSA t had suddenly gone up, but again, there can be so many reasons. So the next thing was that they took samples, uh, and they divided the prostate into 12 sections, and they said that uh, um, f seven of them, first they made a mistake between eight and seven, and somehow eight was a, a larger delineation and put you into a real fear, and seven, they weren't sure. 
So they took out his prostate. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what, once you get to the point where you have, uh, you're, you put it under the microscope, the samples, what, what do you judge from that point, whether or not to take out the prostate or take out parts, and, and also it was done robotically, and mm -hmm. the guy said, oh, um, that's much better, as you're saying. So it, it's, it's a good question, but the major question I would ask back to you is that was your husband offered watchful waiting? Which is to say, yes, we've done a biopsy. Yes, it has this level of uh, cancer cells. Are you prepared to do nothing and we'll come and test you next year, perhaps the year after, and we'll see if it changes? I mean, there are, and that is increasingly the choice of many men who are told this because they're now aware that there is this problem with overdiagnosis. It has gone, they, they did watchful waiting for three years, mm -hmm. but it kept going back into the normal area mm -hmm. and then it spiked in a three month period mm -hmm. higher than it had before. And so then yeah. the doctor recommended, because of that, to, to do these biopsies. But they didn't do the biopsies until it spiked up. But once they did the biopsies and they found the 7 out of 12, then they said you should do it right away. Yeah. So the, the prostate is like a gland that's shaped like a, a golf ball. Well, it's about as big as a golf ball. And they use these needles that go in, and maybe they'll use 12 needles, and, they, and they'll mm -hmm. stick into this, and then they'll pull out little samples of um, tissue and they'll examine them. Well, what if that thing was turned somewhat slightly different and it went in and they only got five? I mean, so, so the, the, the likelihood of eight being significant and, and that being the difference between eight and seven to me seems so um, arbitrary. I mean, we have an obsession with numbers in this country. And if you're, and, and, and this is one of the problems of, again with prostate cancer screening is that you'll tell someone, oh, we'll, 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 we'll do watchful waiting. And then they keep testing and keep testing and keep testing and keep monitoring. And oh, the number's gone up, oh, the number's gone down. This becomes people's lives. And the question is, how much are you not living while you're doing this? Um, you know, and I, I don't want to comment on your husband's specific point, but we do the same thing with something as simple as cholesterol. I mean, the first chapter of my first book was on cholesterol, and I'll tell you why, because of all of the activities that we do medically that I think are probably the most harmful to people is that we check their cholesterol level, then we get people to worry about their cholesterol level, then we give them drugs to alter their cholesterol level, and a lot of times those drugs alter other kinds of things in their bodies, their, their muscles, their, their joints, and so on. And we can cause a huge amount of unnecessary harm just by telling people, I'm going to measure your cholesterol. I've never had my, le my cholesterol tested, and I won't. I've read the studies. I know what the evidence says around cholesterol-lowering drugs. I think that uh, we cause way too much anxiety and psychological distress in the population with this obsession with numbers. Oh, my cholesterol is this. Oh, it was a 3. No, it's down to 2.5. Oh, now it's, you know, and I have, I have friends of mine who tell me, oh, man, my cholesterol went down. And, and they obsess about this. And I say, just, why are you obsessing about this? I've told you many times, the likelihood that your life is going to be shortened by your cholesterol level is very, very small. And the chance that, you're like, the, the chance that your life is going to be extended or improved by taking cholesterol-lowering drugs is also very small. Stop worrying about your numbers. So th you know, this is what I would say to most people who get a number and obsess about it. Yeah. Yes? Oh, sorry, back here. I have a two questions. The first one, how is the, in the most popular magazine in America, there are 20 drugs, uh, advertisement, when this doesn't exist in Europe? Yeah. Second question is, who is really behind the testing industry? Because I discovered in New Jersey, since those machinery are very expensive, very often doctors get together and you know, put together this laboratory, and then they order the test because that's how they make the money. Sure. 
Yeah, so the first question on drug advertising, I tell you, when I come to the United States, and stay in a hotel, the first thing I do is turn on the TV because I want to see the drug ads. I do want to see them. We don't, we don't get them in Canada. Drug advertising on TV, well, in, in, in any media in Canada, when I say drug advertising, I'm talking about prescription drug advertising. Prescription drug advertising is allowed in two countries in the world, the United States and New Zealand. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's because every other country which has a public health system says that Prescription drugs should not be advertised directly to the public because that's a decision a doctor makes. It's one thing to advertise it to a doctor, but to advertise it to the patient, that is somehow unethical. And, and, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm always amazed, by the way, what they're advertising. I saw an ad the other night for an antipsychotic drug, probably one of the most powerful antipsychotic drugs. And they have people like running through fields of flowers, and I'm like, that drug doesn't do that. I, what is this? And they allow this stuff. And, and uh, cancer drugs, these very expensive cancer drugs are being advertised on TV. It's just, it's, it, to me, as a kind of naive Canadian, I'm shocked by this. Um, Direct-to-consumer advertising is a very controversial situation. There's been lots of people who've been lobbying against it. As you know, in America, the pharmaceutical companies are very powerful. Um, they spend three to four billion dollars a year advertising their products directly to consumers, and they do so because it pays off. Um, now your, se your second question about um, being sent for tests where the physicians who are ordering the tests own the lab for which you're getting the test. That happens, it happens, and it, it's, it's shocking that we allow it. Again, it's like saying, you know, don't ask a barber if you need a haircut. The person who's offering you the test should not also be the person who's taking advantage of your decision to buy that test, okay? Um, we've got this situation though which is kind of good and that is when you get prescribed a drug, largely the doctor doesn't benefit. Now, there's, there's some side points to that and some caveats, but largely the doctor decides what treatment you need, you get a prescription, you go to the pharmacy and fill it out. The doctor doesn't own the pharmacy. Sometimes the doctor owns the pharmacy and tells you which pharmacy to go. But largely, uh, in, in, in most major you know, uh, industrialized countries, we have separated the act of writing the prescription from the act of buying the prescription. And that's not the same in every country, but that's kind of a good thing because you don't want the doctor to be saying, oh, take this drug. Though, of course, the doctor might have shares in the company. They might, have, uh, they might be on a speaking arrangement with the company that's promoting that drug. And in fact, in the U.S., just recently, there have been sunshine laws. Do you know what these are? These are, th these are uh, ways for you to, um, to find whether your doctor is taking money from the pharmaceutical industry. There is a... Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, there's a website where you can go and you can see how much your doctor has taken from various uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, over the years. That's publicly, publicly available knowledge, and that's a new thing. We don't have that in Canada, so we don't know. Yeah. Any other? Um, uh, I think, okay, here and then here, okay? Uh, I was a little bit late, I apologize, but uh, did you say or mention something about dentistry? Oh, dentistry, don't get me going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you mean in terms of... Uh, of all of this, well, uh, over or a very aggressive yeah. and invasive well, dentistry? No, I, I, I haven't examined it, though I have looked at the evidence uh, around various dental procedures, because I got kids, right? Right. So. So you take your kid to the dentist, and the dentist says, oh, we've got to do an x-ray. Um, and I say, I don't think so. And the dentist says, well, yeah, we, could do, you know, we, we, we can't see all cavities with the naked eye. We have to go in there. And I say, my son, I say to my son, do you have any symptoms? Do you have any pain or anything? No. Then you're not giving my kid an x-ray, period. Though... It's set up to really sell the power of the, of, the, of the x-ray. So this is a screening test. This is a screening test for which you should be asking questions. Mm -hmm. It's a simple one, and it's fast, and it's probably not that harmful. But he's a 12-year-old kid. I mean, should he be getting x-rays twice a year for the rest of his life in his mouth? Hmm. I know when they do the x-ray, the, 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 the hygienist goes and stands behind a lead screen. That gives me some signal something's going on there. 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on, on dentistry, but, but things like that, like, like dental, um, dental x-rays, we all should be asking questions. If you don't have any symptoms, what kind of fishing expedition is this? Mm -hmm. And in Canada, you have to buy private insurance in order to get your dental, you get it through your uh, employer. And guess what? There's a good chance that if they tick the box that you've had the dental x-ray, then, then they charge the insurer an extra 50 bucks for what? five seconds worth of work, it's pretty good money, you know? So I'm, I'm very skeptical about, as you could imagine, promising be. that, oh, there could be some hidden disease, in there. and there, there might be for some condition. Apparently, if you've got a crown, there, there can get, the bacteria can develop underneath it, and, and it might be something for which you would need an extra. But a, a normal kid with a healthy set of teeth, yeah, and, and, and don't get me going to orthodontics, because orthodontics is another, so I'll have every orthodontist in the world wanting to um, uh, put a hit on me. Yeah. But no, I, I mean, we've been through that with our kids, with, with the, um, oh, your kids' teeth are, are not coming in properly, they need, and so on and so on, and, and then the $6,000 bill, and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, also, I was going to tell you that, I just, just I'm a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> but I am in your side. Yeah. No. And oh. secondly, yesterday, I just have a, I, do, I only do <coughs> outreach and education. <coughs> I am a holy represent a foundation called Holistic Oral Health, and we only in this people side, no? And I left, I stepped down from that because I didn't know better when I couldn't believe that they were alienating me to do dentistry, you not know, to avoid it, mm -hmm. to work for the, those friends, yeah. the drug cartel. And then I, yesterday, just the day before yesterday, I have a uh, I second opinion for a three-year-old who was going to be put down because he had a lot of uh, cavities and he was an, a cooper cooperative patient. And then I say, wow, that, ma that many cavities? And then I say, can I pick on your teeth? And he went, ah, you're in just in front of me. That proved that he was an uncooperative patient, and I picked, and he had no cavities. Wow. It was very sad, very so scary. Yeah, so we had a question here next. Thank you so much, Dr. Castle. It's so informative, all this information. I have a question. I am one of those patients that runs to screenings before I'm even asked to. Mm -hmm. um, so. What do we do? What do you say to somebody, not who just runs or does screenings, but like I've had doctors who I've done a colonoscopy, a mammography, a biopsy. I've had those done, and they said to me or others that we've saved your life. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to someone like that? Because it is a very difficult position to be in. Let's say you don't see the symptoms, but you do go for a screening, and like you said, they do find things that oftentimes are not anything um, that doesn't go away with monitoring. But that's like a fine line of like, you know, when a doctor says, I just removed a, a precancerous polyp that would have allowed you to die in two, two years, or he doesn't know that for sure. But it's a very hard position to be in as a patient, as a, as a person in society, where it can help you or prevent you. I mean, and then the other thing I was just going to ask you is, what do you do when you do get the surgery or when they do do a biopsy and leave a titanium clip in you or do things like that? That Can that cause future problems, like this, this, the actual biopsy itself? Because I've read yeah. where certain insertations can actually spread cancers and do things like that. I actually interviewed a woman in, uh, for the book who had the titanium clip and had serious problems from it afterward. And I, I don't know how rare or how common th those problems are, but they do happen, right? I mean, the main thing, whether you're, and, and perhaps you're perhaps more health anxious than, than, than a lot of people, and that's, that's not, a, it's not a human moral failing of, of anything. But as long as you're going it into it with your eyes open. I would say screen as much as you'd like. Um, if you believe that the uh, colonoscopy is gonna find precancerous polyps, they remove them and that saved your life, do some research on that. And I, and I can guarantee you that the, um, no, I can't guarantee because I said, the, 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 uh, I think the jury is still out on the overall benefit of colonoscopy. But, there are a lot of people who have um, 
these polyps removed, there's a lot of people who get injured and, and have perforations and have serious complications just from a simple colonoscopy. I've never had one, but I understand that the, the process that you have to go through before you take them can be quite shocking. Um, so, you know, as long as you're going into it with your eyes wide open, and, and again, and this is one of the major points that I make in the book, is that screening is not an emergency procedure. If you're otherwise healthy, right, you have no symptoms. You can live a long time qu perfectly healthy without screening. You do have time to do research. You too do have time to read up what are the possible harms and the downsides and the costs of, of screening. So it's not a rush. If someone's telling you, get screened now because don't. <laughs> now that's different if you have symptoms. Now again, we're talking about perfectly healthy people versus per people that have lumps or things that they feel or things that are wrong that they, that they do need to be diagnosed. That's a different category. I'm talking about perfectly healthy people told to get screened. Yes? My question is in, uh, there's a lot of deep cleaning coming in, den in dentistry. And you know, I've been going to dentist for many, many years, got good teeth and stuff. And then they say that you need uh, deep cleaning and charge you thousands of dollars. And then I have a daughter that's about 24 years old. Oh, well, she needs deep cleaning. And it's like thousands of dollars. And I'm like, wow. You know, in all my life that I've gone to dentist, all my life, I never heard of deep cleaning until I was 50 years old. And then my daughter needs it at 23. So I, I see more of that coming up. And all they just do is scrape her. And you know, and I looked at how long the procedure takes, like 30 minutes and we're done. And it's thousands of dollars. That's crazy. What do you, well, what's your comment on that? This, this is the first time I've heard the, the um, expression deep cleaning. Yeah, deep so cleaning. so maybe he ha it hasn't come to Canada yet. But you know, <laughs> but in terms See, of, I, knew it. I, I think of what you're talking about is, is pretty intensive hygiene, uh, hygienist getting in there and scraping your teeth. That, they, they do that in Canada. And it used to be uh, the dentist would say, you know, once a year, you got to come back. And I, I even bristled at that. Like, yeah. I, I take relatively good care of my I teeth. Floss, I floss, I do all that. Yeah, yeah. you know, I'm, and I don't have any problems. No. If I had problems, I'd be the first guy in the dentist chair. But again, no problems. What's the, oh, we'll come back now every six months. Really? It used to be I had to come back every year. Now they're, now they're phoning me at home, yeah. leaving, leaving messages on my answer machine telling me, uh, Mr. Castles, uh, you're due for another <laughs> dental cleaning. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, no. Oh. And then they tell you, we'll do your uh, uppers one time and then come back in three months and we'll do your lowers. Because they don't want you to get the big bill in one shot. So is it $1,000 today for this? It was a little more, yeah. Oh, It's wow. crazy. I'm like, I, I, that I, didn't I, sound right to me. So, so I think where, where I live, it, it's, I mean, we have private insurance. It might be a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. I and I think I pay, uh, there's a copay. Of yeah, I just paid them cash. It was like, it's crazy. Yikes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, simple question. Uh, in your opinion, is it worth getting a regular yearly physical examination as the entire medical community wants you to have? That is the best question. So what is the value of the annual physical? Um, again, I would, I would say that I'm, I'm, I've looked very closely at the research. In fact, I'm working with some, an, some animators in Helsinki. We're developing a, a video around the one, the, um, annual physical. So, you know, the annual physical, you're told, go in, you know, get everything checked out. It's like taking your car to the garage, right? You know, to find out if the wheels are wobbling or if the, you know, the, 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 uh, the oil's leaking or whatever. Well, I think, again, that has had a major rethink over the last 40 years. There was a very interesting study done um, in about 1978 where they said, Let's look at the value of the annual physical. So 1978, that's you know, 40 plus years ago. Let's look at the value of the annual physical. And they, and they had a lot of independent experts sit down and sort of hash through the evidence. Like, what is the benefit? The question is, so you've got a population of people, and this population does the annual physical. They go to their doctor religion. This population never goes to the doctor, except for they're sick. So they're, they're, they're not doing the annual physical. So then you, what you do is you follow them over time. You say, does this population do a lot better than no there's, no, there's no difference. And so they, they concluded from this study um, that there is very little benefit to the annual physical. So I, I would say that, but I would put that with sort of brackets around it, that 
again, if you have any concerns, any, any, you know, any lumps, any, any, any murmurs or anything like that, you should get that checked out. But in terms of being perfectly healthy and thinking that, oh, geez, I haven't been to the doctor for a year, I should go, I, I, would, I would counsel against that because there is a good chance, and this could happen. There's not a good chance. There's a possibility that you're going to get sent for blood work and the little boxes will get ticked and you'll end up being screened for something that could radically change your life. And that won't happen if you don't do the annual physical. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my do I went in with a broken hand. This is a couple of years ago. I fell and, and broke my hand. And the doctor started taking my blood pressure. And I'm like, what's that for? He said, well, you know, um, um, there's now a fee item for that. You know, we can, we can start checking blood pressures for younger and younger. Okay. <laughs> it had nothing to do with, with uh, um, yes, so. Do you want us to speak into the microphone? If you are going, they are prescribing something that it has to be interacting with it. If you have a high blood pressure, for instance, or diabetes, they, ca they have to know exactly which anti-inflammatory or painkiller are going to, be because of the interaction, medical yeah, interaction. Yeah. That's only, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, maybe because of that. G going to see your doctor because you have a problem with the drugs you're taking, that, that, I mean, you might be perfectly healthy. That might be a, a perfectly good reason to go and, and, and get, a, get another uh, a second look. Um. Yes, Joanna. Thanks. It was really interesting. I, I just wanted to highlight the sort of political and psychological aspects of this. So when I've been looking at the history of psychiatry in the 19th century, a big motivation for building all the asylums was the idea that if you got to people early and got them into treatment in the asylums, you'd make them better and you'd really just get rid of the problem of madness or insanity or whatever they called it in those days. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, within sort of 20 or 30 years, the asylums just filled up with more and more chronic mm -hmm. people and it was quite clear this wasn't working. <laughs> And then again, when they got rid of the asylums in the, in the um, started to in the 60s, they, they promoted that as um, being good for early intervention because the asylums were stigmatized. Now we'll treat people in the community and be able to get to people earlier. And then recently we've had um, the early intervention in psychosis movement, which um, again, it was the idea that if you intervened early, you could change the course of psychosis or schizophrenia and people wouldn't become chronic. And they've done several trials which show that's absolutely not true. You might help people a bit while you're, while you're helping them, while they're getting lots mm -hmm. of resources and lots of support, they do a bit better, but it makes no difference to long-term outcome. Um, and, and of course, this resulted in, and, and part of the idea behind this movement was to try and get drug treatment started earlier, and the pharmaceutical companies supported the early intervention conferences and uh, academics and research and all that sort of thing. Um, and that was, th their idea was that if you started the drug treatment early, it would prevent the decline in brain, uh, the, the brain damage that's caused by psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, and now it's starting to come out and starting to be recognized that actually that brain damage, that brain shrinkage that was demonstrated in people with that diagnosis it's caused by the was drugs. all in people on drugs and was caused by the drugs, exactly. Yeah. But, but I suppose the main point I just wanted to make is it, it's such an appealing idea. Back in the 19th century, it was this idea that the asylums would prevent, would, you know, would prevent or treat or cure mental illness if you got there early enough. That's, that stimulated this huge asylum building program, which was one of the biggest public expenditure programs ever, um, you know, undertaken in in, uh, in the UK and, and the US as well. Mm -hmm. So it's so appealing. You know, yeah. governments just love the idea that you know you hand out a little bit of money and you can prevent all these future problems. Um, but as you've said, yes. it's it's just not true. <laughs> yes, and and, and you, you know, we don't put people in asylums anymore, we let them sleep in cardboard boxes in the streets. I mean, th th this, is th 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 this is typically what happens. Um, you know, the, 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 this, you're right, the, the drive to, 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 to be, it's, it's an altruistic drive, right? It's, it's not that they're, the, the, and it's a, mi it's a mixture of the altruism of people who want to help people before they get sick, but also the money. The fact that you can make a lot of money by getting people early 
and getting them on drugs and treating them and so on. So it's, it's, it's not the altruists against the profiteers, it's they're working together. And that's why it's so insidious and that's why these companies uh, and, and, and charities are so powerful. They have very well-meaning, very philanthropic people who want to do something for people who are suffering from illness. And they, at the same time, partner with pharmaceutical companies and so on and, and to advance their, um, their agendas. You know, the, the, the one thing that we're doing now, which I think we're going to look back as, as, a, as an absolute tragedy, is increasingly mental health screening is coming into schools. And, and I don't know if you're going to be talking about that. But we're, you know, in, 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 in various cities in Canada, they're instructing the teachers to be almost like mini psychologists to sort of look for signs of, you know, and a lot of times, you'll have problem kids. I, mean, I won't deny that. You'll have kids who live in poverty, who come from um, broken families and, 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 and violence and, and abuse and, and, and neglect. And those kids are very troubled. But then to go to the next step, instead of trying to prevent that fa family breakdown and social breakdown, you, you say, well, now the kid has depression because we've screened him and he scored certain points. And then the only thing that you offer meaningfully uh, you might offer some cognitive behavioral therapy, but typically it's, well, the, there's a big lineup there. Um, in Canada, there is anyways. We'll get you on antidepressants right away. So it's, it's a fast track of taking people who have difficult lives and turning them into patients. And, and I find this, this, this appalling, as opposed to let's try to do something about the social conditions which gave rise to the, to the, the kid who's acting up in class, who's who look sullen because th their parents are fighting all the time or something, you know, that, 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 that they are suffering. But the suffering is not a chemical reaction in their brain that's been identified that way by the pharmaceutical companies, and therefore the kid is just suffering from a lack of serotonin. And his whole world of, 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 of difficulty becomes even made worse because now he has to deal with the, 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 the stigma of having a label and the, 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 the problems of taking antidepressants. So, that sounds, uh, ends on a gloomy note. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got a few more minutes left if anyone else, uh, and if you want to leave early, I'm, I'm fine with that as well. So, and I'd be, I've got some books here if you want to come and talk to me about it. Uh, yes. bit of a morbid question but my husband recently had a hip replacement mm -hmm. and I know they uh, removed the upper part of the femur I asked the uh, orthopedic surgeon what is done with that bone and he gave me you know some kind of absurd comment but I was I was wondering it's not really related to what we're, we've been discussing but what is done with that bone is it reharvested clean sterilized to use for bone you know I, I have no idea I have no idea. Um, as, as you know, hip replacements are done all the time. They do cut off a fair bit of bone. Yeah. I have no idea what they do with it. Just I can't even I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I imagine it goes in with well, other medical waste into some kind of incinerator. I don't. I, I, if teeth can be harvested, you know, if, if, if uh, dental tissue can be harvested, mm -hmm. cleaned and, and reprocessed. I just wonder. In yeah, yeah, whole so, profits. So and so I was just wondering what that connection. So. Well, Extracting bunch of uh, every single orthodontics are saying every case is extraction case because they are getting the pre the bicuspids and they are getting the stem cells. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. And and well maybe I, they I are have the I documentation. I will forward to you. Um, so you made me a favor to help. <laughs> so what you're saying is that my next book should be about dentistry. <laughs> then I'll have all the health professionals of the world disliking me, not just a few of them. <laughs> That one more question down here. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the point about the, um, uh, well, this is Hippocrates. They, they deal with a lot of issues with, uh, with health and uh, using sprouts and uh, diet. And that's not what you get back when you get a lot of these screenings. These doctors are not trained to go in that direction. No. They go straight for 
the diagnosis, the pill, give the kid Ritalin, mm -hmm. you know, things in that matter, they'll just go for a pharma before they give them an alternative. And a lot of these uh, uh, screenings that they do, a diagnosis for a PCA that's high may not necessarily be something that has to be, you know, they'll go for a surgery right away. They're gonna jump at this. But uh, this man may have time, six months, a year, to really try and see if he can change his diet. Mm -hmm. And with proper uh, guidance, you know, maybe if he takes his PCA a year later, after he's removed a lot of toxins from his body and um, uh, exercised, uh, maybe uh, did a few treatments, maybe some salt palmetto, people say salt palmetto. But, you know, these are the type of things that uh, are not uh, instructed to that person and they don't give them that opportunity to, to even realize that their diet's bad mm -hmm. and they are going in a bad path anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, I, I think if you ask most doctors how much nutrition education they got in medical school, they would probably shake their heads and say either nothing or almost nothing. And it's, which is kind of a state of the shocking, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comment on our, on our medical system, in fact, where, you know, nutrition, wasn't, it, wasn't Hippocrates who said food is medicine? Uh, Right, but I mean, even the, the, the Hippocrates, the, the old guy. Um, so, you know, the, the, the fact that very little of our medical care focuses on nutrition is, you know, I think most people would agree that's a huge missing, uh, missing piece. I think you'll pick up a few more th things at this conference than you will at any other medical conference about the, the benefits of, of, of nutrition. I d that's not my area. I don't know much about it. I, Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, probably the best example of, of diet-related health condition would be diabetes, where, you know, vast numbers of people are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when we know uh, that altering their diet for the most part is going ch to change that. They're, they're going to have to get rid of the insulin, they'll get rid of the drugs, they, w they will most people will be able to solve their, their problems with diabetes uh, by altering their diet. We know that. Yeah.